No tomorrow Then I find it kind of funny I find it kind of sad The dreams in which I'm dying Are the best I've ever had I find it hard to tell you I find it hard to take When people run in circles It's a very, very Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the penultimate session of uh, Halifax 2013. Um, those were real tweets, by the way. Um, they were not illustrations. Those were what the Boston bomber was writing in a little room in a little part of a city um, that was already very famous but became uh, part of the global headlines um, due to the bombing uh, that took place in that city, and we all remember it. Um, You'll see the title. Um, <clears throat> it can be a little bit difficult to work out what that means, which is, in fact, part of the point. Uh, free radicals with return tickets, Boston, Nairobi, and then and the future of terrorism. Um, the issue that, that really I think we're trying to confront here is that uh, our perceptions, obviously, of modern terrorism are heavily uh, influenced by 9-11, and that's completely understandable. Uh, what appeared to be a very sophisticated operation uh, using modern technology, the airplane, with people being trained, with people being implanted in the United States, uh, and mounting uh, the greatest and, and most horrific terrorist attack uh, of modern times. Uh, in recent years, it seems that things have been different. Of course, in parts of the world uh, outside the West, uh, and people outside the West would rightly chide us for saying uh, that terrorism uh, is less of a problem than we might have feared that it was in, uh, back in, uh, uh, in the days of September 11. Um, but in fact, the reality is that there haven't been massive repetitions of 9-11. Uh, while we have seen uh, terrorism uh, frighten people, do what it's supposed to do to terrorize people, simply by virtue of relatively small and what appear to be disparate and disorganized individuals and very small groupings who can nonetheless strike terror into the hearts of uh, ordinary citizens. Um, this panel is, is obviously wide-ranging, and it's a kind of push the boat out in terms of thinking. Uh, and, and that also means uh, that that we want to be very interactive in this particular panel because this is an expert audience. Uh, there are people here from different parts of the world who can provide a uh, different perspective on this issue. Um, but to guide us through the discussion, we have a, a wonderful panel this morning. And I'd like to introduce uh, the panel starting on my uh, far right, um, uh, Mr. Pedro uh, Morenes, the Minister of Defense of the Kingdom of, of Spain. It's a great honor to have you here. Thank you for being here. Um, sitting next to Mr. Morenes, we have Mr. Faria al-Muslimi, Yemen's colleague at Beyond Reforms and Development. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we're also very privileged to have Canada's uh, Minister of Public Safety, the Honorable Stephen Blaney. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, uh, last, but uh, of course by no means least, we have Orno uh, Donjon, uh, the Chair of the Subcommittee on Security and Defense at the European Parliament. I wanted to start out with a general question to all of you, starting with Mr. Morenes, um, which, in a sense, if the answer is no, would put quite a lot of people in this room out of a job, which would also be a wonderful thing. Um, is there still a terrorist threat? And if so, what form does it take? Are there really organized groups out there? Is there a danger that, in fact, the successes of our counter-terrorism agencies could make us complacent and allow the public to believe that there isn't a threat anymore precisely because of the successes of what they've done? Um, or is it that in any event we're not going to let up on these groups? The terrorist groups know that and therefore the way, if you're thinking from their point of view, to cause problems for our societies is in fact to activate small groups or, or even to put it in the passive sense that individuals simply acting on their own, those free radicals, that they will be the ones that are going to menace us um, for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. 
Well, the, the real fact is that uh, in all the operations, Spain, foreign operations, military operations, we are involved. We are involved in areas where, and precisely because of the terrorism there. So we are in Afghanistan, we are in Mali, we are in Somalia, we are against piracy, which is a type of terrorism as well, and based on on, on uh, terrorist organizations. So uh, it is a fact that the terrorists exist. This cannot be denied. Another thing is uh, well, the level of intensity of the terrorism is uh, in this very moment. Uh, this is uh, the, the first uh, thing I would like to say. The second thing is that uh, um, the, the way of thinking of uh, some type of terrorist in Spain, we have fought against terrorism, internal terrorism, for 40 years, um, which is a different type of terrorism and all based to different type of uh, understandings of, uh, of the principles of the fight. But, uh, but the terrorism, the jihadism, the terrorism, the radicalism Islamic, is based on a principle which is very much against the way in which we think things happen in, 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 in the West, which is that this is not in the frame of time. It doesn't depend on time for getting the results that they are, they are looking for. And therefore, it is a very, very complicated to judge when things are going to happen because this is a very long, long-term, possibly something that is out of the time to decide when the attacks uh, will come. So uh, with these two things, first, the terrorism exists. Second, it is not under the same understanding and how things in the world, of, uh, in, the, in the Western world, we think it works. It is something really, um, really uh, risky to say we have slowed down the terrorism uh, because uh, the third th uh, thought is that... Um, when there is an attack, when I was involved in, in security in Spain, we had many, many problems and people dying in, uh, by problems of health, by problems on the road, by uh, labor accidents. But one attack of the terrorist killing one single people changes the mentality of the whole society. It's a totally different way to understand the loss of people in a country. Yeah, I mean, th that's, that's a very interesting point because when people talk about risk analysis, obviously, you, you know, you're going to look at the number of people who die in car crashes. And there are some people who will say, well, your chances of dying in a car crash are, I don't know what are the, the figures, one in 5,000 a year or something like that. Your chances of dying in a terrorist attack maybe one in 5 million. Uh, and therefore, that means we shouldn't actually take the precautions. But you're centrally pointing out and reminding us that, no, it, even one single attack does what it's supposed to do. It terrorizes the whole of the society. Um, I, I wonder, um, uh, Faria, from, from your part of the world, uh, how you see things. Obviously, you know, Al-Qaeda, certainly the way it gets reported in the Western media, is a significant force in, uh, in your country. Uh, and so the sense that the, there aren't organized groups uh, um, attacking the West, or arguably, and we'll see what other people have to say, that's certainly not the reality you confront in your country, is it? I mean, I, I guess it's um, whether, I mean, if you come from that part of the world, whether it's good news or bad news, it's mostly misreported rather than reported. So what I mean is probably whether, uh, um, I, I guess Al-Qaeda, probably the one you're talking about, does not exist in Yemen. We're talking in al about Al Qaeda's. Um, and it's not anymore that specific one group that you can imagine that will organize attack against the United States, or that is motivated by ideology as we expect it to be. Um, it's gonna have its. It it it, it is not the 9/11 format or the one that is necessary. Just wants to. Um, it's not anymore the Osama bin Laden Qaeda's. I think, or the, the Qaeda of Osama bin Laden. It's, there is so many different reasons and motives um, behind it. It can be, I guess, one of the things, um, in, in, in a very interesting conversation I had recently with a tribal leader from the middle of Yemen, he said that the local leader of Al-Qaeda is complaining to him that um, uh, uh, his members or his soldiers do not pray, um, are not religious. And why? Um, and, and, and that would uh, probably not exactly the Al-Qaeda, the one you would have in your mind. Um, most of these people probably have joined him for 
I, I think either political reasons um, or most probably, as I have seen it in many cases, as a seek of, of revenge for um, because their innocent relatives died by U.S. Uh, drone strikes. Now, does that mean will they be will uh, will 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 they um, not attack the United States if they can? That's a different question. But I guess um, counterterrorism have also, in a way or another, participated in creating a new sort uh, or or a new type of terrorism that no one can ever think about. And that is the real danger to come. It's probably you're going to think about that when we look uh, what will happen to these hundreds of people now fighting in, in, in Syria um, from around the region funded by regional cash um, when they come back home. As will we have the same problem as we did in the 80s, where they came back and they created uh, al Qaeda as of that time? I, I guess most probably yes. And we'll, we'll, it's, it's yet to come, the, the, the new terrorism. Oh. Well, Parry, we'll come back certainly to the question of, you know, what causes the terrorism and what's motivating them. But just to, there was one particular point about that you mentioned, and I think people will have picked up on it. You said it's not about Al-Qaeda, it's Al-Qaeda's. Absolutely. What exactly do you mean? I mean, can you just give us a, a more precise sense? I mean, immediately I would think that means there isn't a single group with a single leader, that there are multiple groups. But, uh, I mean, uh, how many multiple groups? I mean, and are these groups of where it's sort of like five groups of thousands of people, or is it literally hundreds of groups where it might be just two or three people? What, what are we talking about? I mean, all of that. Um, there, is, there is, you know, the hundreds, and there is the few people. There is, um, uh, I, I, I tend to say it, at least, for example, in a country like Yemen, the reason behind the spirit of Al-Qaeda was not an ideology or conservative or traditional country. That's actually a big myth about Yemen. But rather, I think it was political reason. There is zero uh, social contract between the Yemenis and the current government, as, it, as there was in the past. Um, so you would have sometimes this, you know, I, I guess even at one point, like Anwar Awlaki, uh, some people who would come back very skilled, uh, very well educated, and this is not their government. This is the world government in their country. So Al-Qaeda would provide the leadership positions. It would provide uh, a, a way to, to use and enhance these skills, and it was their chance. And uh, that's, that's one type. Um, the other one, I think, is in, in places where the government was unjust um, or mis, uh, misused its power, there was local governments, um, which, which, was no, which is known here as Ansar Sharia. Um, these groups, by way or another, do not necessarily at all aim to attack the West, but they aim to have their own government, uh, their own province in Yemen. Um, that's one another group. You would have a different unorganized groups who are um, frustrated with the drone strikes and who lost civilian victims and would want to revenge. These people, you know, sometimes Al Qaeda, the, the international one, uh, would, would, uh, would recruit them. Sometimes they will try themselves probably to. Um, to release this power. I, I guess what, what you're talking about is a real knife that is there. Who is cutting with this knife? That is a completely different question. Um, sometimes it cuts with itself. Sometimes, uh, you know, internal political domestic, actually, uh, manipulation of Al-Qaeda, especially when you look into the former regime. I guess the war with Al-Qaeda was never about who will be in charge of Yemen, but rather of who will be in charge of Al-Qaeda. Who can misuse this the most? And that's a third or fourth probably type of Al-Qaeda you're talking about. Um, but I, I, I guess the one we are speaking about or we expect here in, in such panels is a ghost more than a reality. Well, we'll, we'll certainly come back to that. There's a lot to talk about on that particular point. Uh, Minister Blaney, um, how does the Canadian government, uh, I mean, you know, there the, are the tactics and the strategy. In terms of the strategic approach, is your approach that you are, you have perhaps a, a double track approach, that you are always on the lookout for organized groups, but then mm -hmm. you're also aware of the, the free radicals, the individuals that are going off and doing this on their own? Uh, and, you know, how, if it is about the free radicals, as we're calling them, mm -hmm. um, how do you manage to keep tabs on such people? And this brings in the whole question of the, mm -hmm. the NSA and the spying and Snowden and all the rest of it. Um, you know, without spying on the whole population to try and get the, mm -hmm. uh, get the information you need. I mean, I wonder if you could talk about the, the dilemmas that you're facing by the fact that terrorism appears to be mutating. Well, uh, Robin, if I may, your question, and I feel it's important to answer, is uh, should we care about terrorism? And you mentioned some <coughs> statistic, and there are the lives taken, but there is also the huge and dramatic 
psychological and social impact of terrorism attack on society, the very, my very own department, public safety, was created because of one terrorist attack, September 11. So that tells how important it is for us to tackle with this threat that is evolving as we've just uh, laid out. And of course, uh, we need to prevent, we need to, uh, uh, we need to detect those uh, individuals who may be uh, fascinated by the uh, conflict that took place uh, if they were like new Canadian in, uh, in the country where their background is. And then we need, able, we need to be able to deny and uh, arrest or take action. And if eventually there are attacks, we need to be able to respond. So that's our overall strategy. But the understanding and the prevention is important. And I think as a society, we have to send a strong signal that if you are to use violent means to reach your goal, this is not acceptable. We will ensure that we take uh, preventive action. We will make sure that uh, our policemen are reaching out, that uh, I met with uh, uh, Iman, I, m I meet with the Somali community who come to us and say, help us because our young are being radicalized. So how can we help you and how can you help us so every Canadian feels safe in this country? So in a nutshell, we, uh, we, uh, we have a, a policy branch. We need to, uh, we need to, uh, we, we have the, uh, we need to make sure that those who want to travel abroad to commit terrorist attack uh, know that this is criminal. That's why we amended the Combat Terrorism Act. We need to, strand, to send strong legal signal and on one part, but we also need to uh, reach out to those community to, uh, to better integrate them and, and, uh, I, and make some even more research on why an individual uh, is uh, being, uh, um, is being um, uh, permeable, is being, uh, um, is being, uh, comment on arrive finalement à faire en sorte qu'une personne uh, se laisse influencer par those, uh, those radicalizers. So, so there's much we can do, but uh, one terrorist attack is too many, and we ought to be uh, to take everything we can to prevent it. So you, if I understood the French correctly, what you're saying is that what is it that makes them susceptible to this yeah. in the first place, and you have to address that. Yeah. Um, and that that does you know we've, we use the phrase in this discussion free radicals. I mean, and we'll come back to the question of what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Faria wants to talk about this the question of what it is that radicalizes people. Um, just turning now to the European perspective, to the, the pan-European perspective, uh, Mr. Donjon, do you, do you find that your colleagues in the European Parliament and in the associated institutions of the European Union still regard the terrorist threat as real? Now, of course, uh, I'm not expecting you, even if you thought that people were being complacent, to say, no, everybody thinks everything's wonderful. But, but how urgent is it? And in what respect, coming back to the original question, is the perception in the European institutions um, of what terrorism means these days, the sense of is it big organized groups or is it these free radicals? Well, uh, good morning. First, thank you for uh, this kind of recognition of European, European Parliament's role in security on this side of the Atlantic. I do appreciate that. It's not shared by everybody, That's even on the other side. Uh, well, many questions. First, I think, um, there is a legitimate uh, uh, and logical, understandable concern uh, right now in Europe, but also in the US and in Canada, uh, towards um, what we have called uh, self-radicalized lone wolves, mm. uh, uh, people who, like a Boston case, we had the Mera case uh, in France, and, mm -hmm. and there is a, a big concern. And But it tends, um, I think, to... Uh, uh, overshadow, I would say, the other front lines and the top priorities for the terrorists and Al-Qaeda affiliated terrorists are probably not our territories like it used to be in the, uh, in the 2000 years. Um, uh, these phenomena are not to be uh, minimized or underestimated. 
But when we compare in terms of casualties, um, the, uh, any shootout in a US school or uh, uh, in a, a university is much more uh, damaging in terms of casualties than Boston, for example. Uh, same thing in Europe, the Mera case. Mera shot at seven people. It's much too much, of course. But still, when we compare to the Breivik case in Norway, with dozens of people killed, uh, it's not to, uh, once again, it's not to minimize and to underestimate the impact, the psychological impact of a terrorist, Islamist terrorist act on the European soil. But compared to what we have experienced in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, in Madrid, in London, of course in New York, um, it has nothing to do in terms of scale and probably in terms of nature as well. Because uh, when we talk about the terrorists mm -hmm. uh, and the groups uh, we are talking about today, uh, their front lines are elsewhere now. Uh, and uh, uh, many reasons for that. First, um, a lot of measures have been taken uh, in uh, Europe and, uh, and in, uh, in, in, in the US against uh, the networks and the networks, uh, the, the, the global networks uh, able to act massively on our soils have been largely disrupted, of course in Afghanistan, but also uh, at home. Second, um, a lot of these groups have now different agendas. The agenda, the, the, the global agenda of Al-Qaeda uh, in the 90s and in the beginning of the 2000 years was uh, to alienate the Muslim world and uh, the Western world, the Western society. Mission accomplished. And also b because of our failures to treat rightly these questions. And we proclaimed the war on terrorism. We globalized the war on terrorism, not focusing on the real targets, not only. And then uh, it gave uh, Al-Qaeda a kind of a victory. There is an alienation between the Muslim world and the Western world. So mission accomplished largely for them. So they do not need to, ha to, to, to have a spectacular action against the West to show that they are against the West. Uh, it has been largely uh, achieved. So now their primary goal is to seize powers in some places. We have this case in Syria. We had the case in Somalia. They were trying to push in Mali, for example, wrongly, but they, they did try. Um, and, and so they, their primary goal now is to seize power where they can and also uh, to uh, use the lawless zones, we, the large lawless zones we, has, we have, of course, between Pakistan and Afghanistan, but also uh, the Horn of Africa, the Sahel region. Mm -hmm. These are the places where the more active. Once again, I don't want, do not want to underestimate the threat at home. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have the opportunity to strike, they will strike again, mm -hmm. of course. But I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a primary focus now. And we, mm -hmm. we have to uh, understand that as well uh, in the way we fight uh, these, uh, these groups. When you ask, uh, and I will end with that, but when you ask about the perception in Europe, I think it's, uh, it's very different. Uh, my country, France, has been used to, to be targeted by terrorists uh, uh, even before the Al-Qaeda actions, uh, spectacular actions in New York and elsewhere. We had uh, uh, bomb attacks in the mm -hmm. 80s, in the 90s. <coughs> it was different phenomena. It was linked to, uh, uh, to uh, Lebanon. It was linked to Iran. It was linked to uh, uh, Libya sometimes. Um, uh, different motivations. But uh, I would say uh, Spain, France, Britain, we have a lot of countries which are used to that. Uh, when you go uh, to uh, other countries, uh, and I would say new members within our uh, European community, um, the sensitivity is less. Uh, for example, when there was a French intervention in Mali, everybody supported uh, on the principle. But still, uh, many uh, European countries did not send people there, or very uh, marginally, because they do not feel really threatened at home. Same when we envisage a, a huge strategy, a European strategy uh, in the Horn of Africa, because we say it's our primary importance, strategic importance for us to fight terrorism there as well. A lot of people would say, well, fine, we'll go with you, but we still don't understand exactly how we, we could be affected by some, something coming from the Horn of Africa. So the, the, the perception is a bit uh, different. Mm. I think that drawing sort of the the, uh, the common thread, uh, perhaps very much took a slightly different line. Um, one way of, of, of phrasing this, and one could answer yes to both of the above, is that either we have been very successful, actually, in scattering the organized nature of terrorism, 
is that it's very, very difficult for these groups to sustain organized groups with an international dimension. They might, as you said, perhaps, Mr. Donjon, you said that in particular places, they will want to establish a foothold. That's more their aim now. But essentially, because of the successes and the determination of Western powers, uh, it, it has not become, a, it, it's no longer an option for them to, to mount sustainable organizations and campaigns from those organizations to seriously <coughs> disrupt Western society. Another way of interpreting the, the whole situation, as I say, you could answer yes to both of these, is that maybe we exaggerated the threat in the beginning. Now, I'm not suggesting no. that's correct. I'm playing devil's advocate with no. this. But it is possible, one could argue, that, that we, we exaggerated the threat in the sense that, yes, there, were, there was al-Qaeda, but al-Qaeda was pretty much the only enemy that was going to be capable of doing this sort of thing. Um, and then, as I say, you could answer yes because you say there's a middle ground. It's not that we exaggerated. Of course we had to take serious action. Um, but we're sort of in a middle ground between the two now that we've scattered them enough that they can't mount major international actions like 9-11. Or maybe they could mount one but can't mount multiple ones. And I think we forget when we went back to 9-11, the real fear after 9-11, this was going to be happening every month or every <coughs> six months. And, of course, it hasn't. So I wonder where, where you find yourself, perhaps, Mr. Morenes, on this. As I say, and I, I'm playing devil's advocate in the suggestion, because there is a view out there that we exaggerate. Of course, there's a very widespread view out there that we exaggerated the threat. Um, my personal preference is that we actually scattered that threat and we reduced it. Um, but w where do you stand on that? And then Mr. Blaney seems to want to come in as yeah, well. So, yes, immediately. Well, I think that um, you never exaggerate in matters of security. You have to... Prepare yourself for the worst always. This is a principle of uh, providing security to the, to the society. And you cannot uh, gamble with, uh, with, these, uh, with these matters because uh, when the problem comes, if you are not ready, the disaster comes uh, as well. And um, therefore, I think that um, uh, we have seen what... Uh, first of all, we are speaking about terrorism and terrorism is uh, just is not only the terrorism of uh, radical Islamism or linked with that. Terrorism is whatever activity can destroy the principles of the society in which we want to live through uh, criminal actions which are precisely f in some way favored by, by the, by the uh, freedom organization that we have in the West, which is very weak against the um, people that use this weakness, weakness of freedom, weakness of, of living in, in the way we live, for uh, destroying the system and getting their objectives in a very, in a very uh, uh, simple way. It is not very easy to be a terrorist in a country without, uh, which is uh, where there is no freedom, where there are, there are a, a very huge uh, structural police pressure on the, on, the, on the people. So it is exactly like this. So um, if we are only speaking about terrorism linked with the jihadism and with, 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 with Islamic radicalism, Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda's, that's okay. But we are, and here has, it has been mentioned, all the type of terrorist attack to the society which, in which we should be, because, because we need the same uh, tools to fight against them. We need uh, prevention, the, we need intelligence, we need, uh, mm, uh, we need all types of uh, measures that can avoid that the terrorist attack happens. And when you are involved in security, you never know what is the success of your activity. You never know that. You all only know the disaster. I, I was involved in this type of, of, of fight, and uh, there was no, um, no uh, motives for celebration. There were always situations which uh, were not, uh, we were not able to avoid. And this is something that, for me, is a must to take the thing even more seriously, in a more, in a more serious way than, uh, than uh, probably in a, in a more intellectual way of understanding the problem you could do. Yeah, I, I take from that that essentially that the post-9... What, what has happened essentially in the post-9-11 world is that 
anti-terrorism has become part of the security infrastructure in, in the form of an insurance policy, which is pretty much the way that defensive, you know, serious nations who have a serious defense policy don't anticipate they go to war every six months. They just want to have the capability uh, not only to start to, to be able to act if they need to, but also to, to show others that they're ready and therefore to deter them in advance. And that's a, a part of the strategy. Mr. Blaney, is that how much you, well, how will you see things that uh, way from Canada? Well, in the course of the last year, uh, we had uh, two uh, successful uh, terrorist attack uh, derailed. The first was a loan, a, a convert on our Canada Day in British Columbia. The other one was a more structured attack, which is still, uh, uh, the investigation is still going, but that was a uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, as if I can put it that way, uh, attack on a train derailment that could have caused uh, major, major damage. So the threat uh, the, is still there and we need to tackle with it. But I agree with uh, Mr. Arnaud Dangean when he says that, you know, there's now, internet is neutral, but of course you can get the information and it's widespread. So if an individual in my country is willing to leave, uh, let's say in Syria, to commit attack, we need to be able to monitor those individuals, as the uh, minister has alluded, uh, uh, to, uh, to prevent them from doing things. Or even we have uh, one out of nine uh, terrorists who come back uh, is considered as a hero by the radicalized uh, people. So we need to be able to track them. And in order to do so as government and society, we need to give us the tool, as uh, President Obama did with Prime Minister Harper with the Beyond the, the Border uh, agenda, which need to have a better exchange of information. We need to be able to monitor uh, those individu individuals who represent a threat here or abroad or even bigger when they come back. So in that uh, sense, I agree that we need to uh, be able to work with our partner uh, collectively to tackle with this new uh, e evolution, if we can put it that way, of uh, terrorism and of their target. Right. Anna. Uh, yeah, I don't think we exaggerated the threat. I think it was a real threat, as we could see that. Um, uh, and there were uh, efficient uh, action taken, military action, legal actions, uh, anti-terrorist intelligence action taken by, by the West. Uh, having said that, uh, once again, uh, we should not underestimate uh, uh, the geopolitical changes uh, affecting the terrorists themselves. Um, uh, they do not uh, attack our societies just for the simple pleasure, don't misquote me, but uh, of attacking us and, and setting up uh, bomb attacks. Or, uh, they have agendas, especially uh, uh, very well organized groups like Al Qaeda or regional affiliated groups to Al-Qaeda. They have agendas. And the agenda was not only to strike the West. The agenda is to establish their own government, their own caliphate in some part of the world. Uh, and in, the, in 2000, except maybe in Afghanistan, there were no place in the world where they were uh, uh, near to reach that goal. It's totally different today. They almost reached that goal, uh, and partially they did in Somalia. They partially did that in Mali. They partially uh, did that uh, uh, in, in the Arabic Peninsula. They, they are uh, acting now in Syria. To some extent, they have been doing that in, in, uh, in another way. Uh, but in Egypt also, they were feeling that they were almost reaching the goal. So, uh, so they, did, they do not need now to strike us the way they did. It, will, it does not mean that it will not happen again, because one phenomenon uh, common to the end of the 90s and uh, the, the age we're entering now is uh, the people who go to, to fight the jihad, those who went to Afghanistan, these people after that uh, uh, set up uh, Al-Qaeda and, and the networks that attacked us. Uh, the same way we have now a lot of people from our regions going to Syria, going to Sahel, going to Somalia and ready to come back. And these people could strike us again. Uh, so, uh, but I think we should not underestimate the geopolitical changes. And, uh, and also, intellectually speaking, uh, uh, what happened, for example, in Egypt to me seems very, very interesting. And we have to look after that very, very carefully. Because do not uh, forget that Muslim Brotherhood, uh, established 85 years ago, was the root of all these groups ideologically speaking. And now this group 
uh, which still has an influence. Most of the Al-Qaeda senior people were coming from Muslim Brotherhood uh, branches. Uh, uh, they felt that they, they could uh, access to power. Now the frustration is big, uh, huge. And uh, I don't know if uh, we rightly deal uh, in Egypt proper with, with this phenomena, but th this could backfire again. That's, I think, a perfect segue into uh, Faria al-Muslimi, because I know, Faria, that you have a particular view on, on how the West should move in terms of its counter-terrorism strategy, which comes back into the reasons why people get radicalized in the first place. And, and this will be uh, a segue into bringing the audience into the discussion. But Faria, I know this is very, very much part of your thinking. Could you give a sense as to where you're coming from in terms of what is radicalizing people now? Uh, to go into terrorism or to be associated with terrorist groups? I mean, I, I, I guess one of the biggest issues is this has not really been a war in terror as much as it is war with terror. And what does that mean is um, it has been so defensive. Right now, the standard for, for measuring success is, is there another 9-11? There is no another 9-11. They were successful. So it's always a defensive policy. Um, that might prevent 9-11. That might prevent Boston. But it will not prevent the new versions of terrorism. It's too technical um, and not, I think, does not necessarily the current approach of the West. Uh, what, what are the new versions of terrorism? <laughs> what are? What are those new versions of terrorism? No, I mean, it, it takes a different shape. First, it took 9-11, then it took Boston. Now it's going to take probably cyber um, terrorism and so on. But what, what I mean is the issue is this. The, I think the counterterrorism policy has been so narrow that it calculates only what are the goals of al-Qaeda right now and if it succeed in banning them rather than actually eliminating al-Qaeda completely or terrorism completely. I, if, if you look into the region, for example, I think one of the, one of the things that eliminated terrorism in, in, the, in, in that part of the world mainly was the Arab Spring um, because it brought hope to people that this will be our government and there is a chance we will, um, you know, we will, we will be represented and, and there will, this social contract that always frustrated people was going to be built. But I think the way how the West dealt with it, whether in Yemen or, or, or now in Egypt, have um, made people, I, I think, hopeless in, in after a ballot, in, in, in the ballot box, in, in, in election. And that is something I don't think it has to do with the region, but rather it has to do with how the West dealt with the region and how the West is dealing with the region and how it is happening um, with I, I mean, it's, I, I recently spoke to some of the US officials about, for example, drone strikes. And the number one success, they say, is we have eliminated the movement of uh, the uh, attacks against the United States by Al-Qaeda since we started using strikes. And that's a very dangerous indicator because all you end up caring about is to ban Al-Qaeda from attacking the United States from Yemen rather than actually ending Al-Qaeda completely. This is probably, I don't know, but I, I, it seems hard for security people to think very long time or very in a, it, in a strategic term. I mean, uh, that's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying you're not, you're not right, but it's, it's a very big ask to get security people to change the way people yeah. see the world because that's essentially what you're saying. You're saying, yes, we can actually break the political group, but if you don't break the underlying ideological or cultural or political reasons that drives them there in the first place, all you do is you get rid of one problem and it sprouts up somewhere else. Well, since you said that security people don't seem to be very good at solving that problem, solve it for us. <laughs> I mean, they have made it too bad you can't solve it. But I mean, the issue is, I guess, it's not one or the other. It's both. You do military action. You do eliminate these groups. But at the same time, you support long-term um, uh, uh, political process, a long-term... Uh, long um, um, I, I guess you have to resh reshuffle everything you're thinking of right now. It's so defensive right now. Most of the attention gets from the Middle East is for Al-Qaeda, for example and not from other powers in the region trying to eliminate Al-Qaeda themselves. Um, so it's, it's, I guess, a, a comprehensive approach. More or less, I, I guess the West have an excellent comprehensive approach toward uh, uh, the Middle East in paper. Um, unfortunately, when it comes into reality, it's, um, especially in the United States, it, security actions take the bigger hand. And I'm not saying don't take the security actions, just do both. Um, otherwise, you will end up just uh, but what it, let me just press you, what, what, okay, do both. What is that other thing that needs to be done? I mean, I, I guess it needs to be not done more than it needs to be done. What I mean by this is, for example, in Yemen, um, 
in, in, in 2011, people went to the street, uh, protested against this regime, and protested against every violent idea, including the idea of Al-Qaeda. Rather than that, the West, I think the United States, the Gulf countries, came and enforced a GCC deal that did nothing more than providing an immunity to their dictator, the most unjust thing that can ever be done to human. That was at the same time Al-Qaeda was giving justice to locals in different remote parts of Yemen. So that, I, I mean, I would say do not stand between people and they're willing to fight terrorism and they're willing to have a democratic country and they're willing to have a civic state because that's more or less what has been happening. Okay, listen, we'll go straight to the audience now. I saw one hand here first, and there, and, uh, and there. So we'll start, we'll do it in threes, please. Thank you. Wherever. Rachel Briggs from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. Um, thank you very much for a really um, informative um, panel. Thank you. I wanted to add an element to it rather than disagree with what I've heard already. Um, and that was... It's inspired really by what I see happening online and particularly in relationship to um, the threat as we see it in the West, principally in, in Europe and North America. I see a very interesting shift happening in tactical terms online. Um, I see um, radicalizers moving to the mainstream of the Internet, as we all are. Mm -hmm. They're all over Facebook. They're all over YouTube. They're all over Twitter. They'll be all over whichever... Uh, social uh, network platform uh, springs up tomorrow. They're not hosting their own blogs so much. They're not hosting their own websites. They're coming to where we are. Now, they're not trying to reach out so much to the converted, to who they think their principal audience is. They are trying to reach out on a much broader, more mainstream um, platform. And I think that's a very interesting tactical shift. Um, they are, we, we talk and, and I talk as, as an analyst a lot about the process of radicalization. Alongside that, I think we have to think about the instant of inspiration. I think it's no coincidence, actually, that Al Qaeda's magazine is called Inspire. Um, we are seeing tactics online which are about inspiring people quickly to pick up a knife and go and kill a soldier in London, mm. on the streets of London. We're, talk we're seeing. Um, inspiration to quickly buy a plane ticket to Turkey to cross the border into Syria. I think we, we need to kind of uh, narrow down our time horizons for this process, and I think it's useful to think about inspiration alongside radicalization. What that means very quickly in response terms is not that the responses that we've very finely tuned already, and which, as you said, Robin, are, are part of our success and, and partly why they have morphed their tactics doesn't mean that we stop doing intel. It doesn't mean that we stop the, the various other activities, but it means that we have to layer on and quickly another a, a layer of activity, which is the war of ideas. And let's not kid ourselves. We're nowhere. And they, they are dominating at the moment. They are all over the Internet. They have compelling stories to tell, which strike a chord with young people who are looking for a sense of purpose. And I, I really, it's a heartfelt plea that governments, with their resource and their capacity and their ability to convene, need to quickly get over the counter-narrative issue and really, really start putting resource into that area. Thank you. The counter, we'll go straight to that. The counter-narrative was, was, in fact, um, in one sense, whether one agrees it was, it was rightly done or wrongly done or wherever you stand in between, that was very much, in fact, the, the, the Bush Doctrine. That's what, well, one aspect of the Bush Doctrine is that you, you have to stand for freedom and you push the case. And in fact, uh, uh, Faria, we talked about this, and I know it's one of your... And I'll come back to you with this particular point, and then everyone else, please jump in. Um, you, you said to me yesterday when we were talking that one of the problems you felt uh, that had been, been made was this idea either you're with us or against us, and therefore not leaving a, leaving a kind of middle ground in between for people who weren't going to act to get involved in terrorism, but then felt so pushed one way or the other that it was the wrong strategy. Now, I'm personally not quite convinced by your argument, but I'm going to allow you to convince me, so please go ahead on the back of what's just been said. It's, it's, not, it's not looking for a, a middle ground between terrorism and non-terrorism, not at all. I, I don't think there is a middle ground when it comes to this specific point of view. But what I, what I think happened is the approach of, I mean, it was drafted shortly or uh, it was said shortly by George W. Bush it, as it's either with us or against or with the terrorists. And that meant, you know, you were not anymore able to say 
9-11 is very wrong, but also do not do Gitmo. 9-11 is wrong, but do not do Abu Ghraib. Nine, that was a, an absent element. I think Al-Qaeda and other groups made use about it. Online, they made use about it uh, from, they took advantage of that fact where, um, you know, you can, you, you probably are not like George W. Bush, but you don't have anything to attack him. However, you were first. When, with that specific, um, I would say, counter-terrorism, somehow there is a parallel direction happening or a, di a parallel line between counter-terrorism and radicalization. One of these clearest examples is whether on, on a technical level uh, and military level the drone strikes, and we have seen that in Yemen. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that in 2009 we had a few hundreds of al-Qaeda. In 2013 we have a few thousands after the drone strikes were done. And on, 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 a, on a thoughtful or on, on, on a subjective level, it was a clear example of Anwar Awlaki, someone who was leading prayer and dialogue inside the U.S. Pentagon. And the second day, he's one of the most wanted people in the world. I think because the, there was no middle ground for that. Uh, yes, please, Anwar. I, I will not contest the fact that there is a, a huge activity on the internet, social networks, and so on, and that's probably a new pattern, tactically speaking. But uh, this assessment, um, when you look at the facts, uh, the huge activity, for example, on the social networks in France, how many of them have come to act? Over the last five years, only two of them. We have six million Muslim people. Uh, it's too, too much, I would say. But, but it's, yeah, it's more than previously. I'm not so sure. Uh, only two have come to act. Um, uh, so uh, I would not overestimate, because one thing is to, to, to be at home, to be totally radicalized uh, and alienated by what you see on internet, uh, and then to go and plant a bomb or, or, or to take action. Uh, I, I would be more cautious on, the, on, on that. Um, the second thing is uh, it's different patterns also when you have these people at home getting self-radicalized, ready to take criminal action, more than terrorist action. Uh, they would call that terrorism uh, to promote themselves, but they are not uh, always affiliated to terrorist networks as such. Uh, and they are basically some criminal people doing criminal activities. It's a big difference with those going to fight in jihadist uh, uh, grounds. And there we come back uh, to the problem when these people will come back. There we have made a connection. But so far, these are a bit of different, uh, different uh, psychological types, uh, different uh, militant activities, and different kind of actions they take. So once again, I do not underestimate. I don't want to, to contest the, the simple fact that it's, it's growing. It's a growing uh, tactical way. Uh, but, but I would contest the fact that it's becoming the new pattern of terrorism, and it's, uh, uh, it's a route for, for, for terrorist activities. Uh, uh, simply, when we consider the facts, it's not that obvious. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Ma, uh, I think this is a constructive comment, and we need to take action. I, uh, I visited Afghanistan as a parliamentarian, and we always said that we needed to win the heart and soul of Afghan people if we want to, to succeed. And I believe this is the same thing that is happening here. And that's why uh, resilience of individual is so important, and we need not to let spread this message that, you know, like the soft, we, not, we need not to be soft. The message has to be clear, and we need to, to develop and that, uh, articulate that counter-narrative uh, to, to fight uh, efficiently against the, these, the germ and the ideas that are behind the action. Thank you. <coughs> Could you stand up and, and to everybody stand up and Certainly. state your name? Uh, and Dixon Osborne, Human Rights First. I wanted to challenge the assertion that one act of terrorism is too many. Not because any of us want another act of terrorism, but because it's a question of, uh, not a question of if, but when. And isn't it a much more constructive framework to acknowledge that fact, to then say these are the steps that we're taking to mitigate the, the, the possibility of another terrorist act, 
uh, and uh, to say that we are a resilient society. We are resilient societies, and we will rebound if an act occurs, and we're not going to rush headlong into war as the response to it. And why that's important is that that dictates the laws and the policies and the funding of whether or not we're going to do a whole-of-government type approach where we're investing in countering violent extremism, development aid, and such, rather than putting the majority of our resources into an armed conflict paradigm. Thank you. Can I bring in uh, Dame Pauline Neville-Jones uh, from Great Britain? Uh, Pauline Neville-Jones, I was um, the British uh, uh, Security and Counterterrorism Minister um, uh, until about um, 18 months ago. I, I hope I can be permitted just to make a comment on the analysis we've yes. heard and say something about, what, uh, about future, which is always a difficult bit. I don't think there's any doubt that uh, there was a real threat, and we did not exaggerate it. Uh, the story has been one of successful disruption uh, accomplished by uh, a, number of, a number of means. Uh, above all, the dismantling of uh, an organized structure uh, among the, the main international threat that we then faced uh, in al-Qaeda, which is one of the reasons why we now have uh, a different form of activity engaged in by the terrorists, that's to say something that's small and local, because they are not capable or able or can be disrupted and detected uh, through communications, which is a very important part of one's ability to get hold of information. So they're reduced, in a sense, to the, the, local, uh, the locally inspired, uh, quickly developed, um, hard to detect, therefore, but small and relatively random and relatively unfrightening uh, activity. Uh, and the big dramas, you know, are not ones that are taking place at the moment. And this is where I come to. I don't think this is a linear uh, scene. Uh, what my great fear is that uh, Syria has seen the build-up of terrorist capability again. Many new jihadis gone in there, developing the skills of killing, uh, 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 imbibing the motivation, the doctrine... Uh, where are these young men, and they're mostly men, uh, going to go uh, in due course? This, this conflict won't last forever. Mm -hmm. They're going to spread. And my fear is, obviously, that they will go uh, down the Gulf. Uh, they will go uh, into the Horn of Africa. They will go across, and they will go into vulnerable parts of East Africa as well. Uh, and they will go across uh, the Sahel, the Sahara, to West Africa. And I think we are... We are going to see, I regret to say, I think we are going to see a recrudescence of serious uh, uh, terrorist threat and activity you know, on what is off the periphery of what is supposed to be a peaceful continent. So uh, we need to be planning for, if I, if I am right in that, and I would be grateful to have the, the, uh, the views of the, the panel on whether that is a, a legitimate uh, anxiety on my part, but we certainly need to be planning for that kind of future. And it will, my, my view is that they will, that the sort of form of terrorism we will see will take the two forms that have been mentioned. That's to say, local activity, designed to, to uh, disrupt, overthrow, and produce other forms of government locally, but also some of it will be directed undoubtedly uh, at Western societies. Uh, we have techniques in Western societies and the so-called prevent, you know, the, de the, the prevention of radicalization and de-radicalization, which remains a Cinderella of policy. It's the hardest bit to do. It's very important. That, but we do know what we need to do there. My question to the panel is, how will you go about, how should we go about strengthening the capacity of societies that may be confronted by this challenge uh, to resist it? Uh, how far can we go in strengthening their security apparatus without running the risk of actually simply reinforcing oppression? How far can we uh, go into development in order to create a different kind of revolution uh, which isn't then captured by those who are you know, our enemies, in a sense, and the enemies of that society? How do we go about it? It seems to me it's very complex, and we ought to be thinking about it, and we ought to be developing the capabilities, and we ought to be in there already doing some of these things. So my question is, what do we do next? Yeah, and, and, this, and I think everything you've said, um, Pauline, I mean, it captures the, the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at the Arab Spring, and we all <coughs> desperately wanted it to succeed. 
And then we look at countries like Saudi Arabia and we think, well, uh, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to have that country as a democracy too? And then we wonder, well, actually, given what happened in Egypt, if we tried democracy in Saudi Arabia, does that make things better? Or, I mean, it, it seems that, uh, I mean, maybe it's just me, although I don't think it's just me. Uh, I think there's a tremendous confusion about how we actually do take the next steps because we understand... I think there's a broad understanding that what happens in faraway lands is not something we can simply ignore. It does come back to us. And yet I don't think anyone's got a clear idea as to, as to what actually we, we, we can realistically achieve uh, and what we should be trying to do. And Mr. Morenes, I wonder if you could perhaps uh, start off uh, giving your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, complex problems need uh, complex answers. It's not... Uh, it's, it's not uh, an easy way to say this is the receipt and, and, and that's all. No, the, I think that uh, it very much depends on, uh, on uh, the, the, the specific place where the, the terrorism could attack, the specific place where the terrorism could come from, and it's different. We have mentioned, uh, Anouj Danjan has mentioned um, the situation in Syria, but uh, the news are uh, that I'm not sure that they are absolutely uh, right, that uh, some terrorists in Syria could have had um, the possibility to, to have the chemical weapons. And if they have the chemical weapons or, or some type of chemical weapon and they want to use these in, uh, in other places in the world, and we shouldn't forget that the terrorism is destroying as well people in the, in the Middle East, people people there in Iraq, in, in Lebanon, in Egypt. In, uh, so we should also, we shouldn't be very selfish and, and looking at the problem of the terrorism as a problem of the people in the, in the Middle East and not our problem because they are not able to come here. Because I think that many things in the world are today linked. Uh, if they, they succeed in establishing a regime like that, in a country of this type, they will not at all renounce to the principles of the, the jihad uh, all over the world. So that uh, the, 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 what I mean is that uh, we should, uh, we should, uh, uh, we should in, in my opinion, as Minister of Defense and a former uh, responsible for uh, Homeland Security, is that uh, we shouldn't uh, lose our, our grip on the problem thinking that, uh, that uh, the problem will be solved um, by, by itself. This is A. And B, it is true, and uh, there is an example very clear, that we should attack the causes and not only the consequences. We should be there and solve the problem and the rules where the, clear, the terrorism is growing up, because if we do not this, we will have the problem forever. Right. Uh, actually, can I just get, uh, because there's so many people who want to say something, can I just ask if it's humanly possible? Abraham Lincoln did one of the greatest speeches in history in 10 sentences. So if you can do something like that in your... Uh, well, no, actually, that took too long for him. So do it okay. in two sentences. Leslie got an ambassador of the Philippines to Canada. Yes, uh, I, can, I intended to make a 30 minutes discourse, but I'll do it in <laughs> a few seconds. Uh, German uh, theologian... Uh, Hans Kung said, once said, there will be no peace among nations if there is no peace among religions. Oh. This, I think, uh, not even one of the panels mentioned anything about religion. It's like uh, the, those framers of the UN Charter, they didn't mention anything about religion or friendship or religion, I, or friendship among religions. Um, way back 10 years ago, we tabled the resolution in the United Nations calling for interreligious dialogue and cooperation for peace. Because we know, the Philippines knows the value of tapping the contribution of the religious leaders. Because these religious leaders have uh, intelligence much superior than those of CIA, you know, in their own home ground. And uh, we were successful, but when we introduced it 10 years ago, the member states were stunned because for the first time there is a resolution on interfaith cooperation for peace. But we argued that uh, what uh, the purpose of that resolution was to galvanize the cooperation among religious leaders among secular lines like development, peace, which does not deal with uh, dogma. And yet, uh, although the resolution is adopted every year, uh, we have to battle every year uh, 
opposition mainly from the European Union because I think the EU is still uh, has the hang over the Westphalian principle of separation and of church and state. But uh, if you look at that principle, it's not really a separation of church and state. Man, before I conclude, uh, well, I don't know who said once that uh, nations and states and empires may will one day be a mere footnote in history, but religions will remain there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the lady here, please. Thank you. And would you, uh, yes, would you stand up and, and um, or if it's uncomfortable for you, sit down, but please state your name and affiliation. Yes. My name is Mona Makram Abed. I come from Egypt, and as you know, Egypt has been mentioned quite often this time. I'm a former senator and parliamentarian. I want to answer your question, Mr. Moderator, which I think is excellent. What is not to be done? I will give you an example of what is not to be done. Uh, as you know, the pillar of Egyptian policy for the past years has been the strategic military cooperation between the U.S. and Egypt. And this is what has, has sustained the peace treaty for 30 years between Israel and Egypt. Today, the Sinai is the cradle of terrorism. It's the cradle of terrorism. It is, unfortunately, there's not much control over it. And so instead of supporting the Egyptian military's efforts to combat terrorism and focus more on their geopolitical interests, on the contrary, the White House has decided to suspend part of the aid and weapons delivery and particularly the Apache helicopters, which are used to combat terrorism in this very vulnerable area. This is not only jeopardizing the national security of both Israel and Egypt, but also of the region. Uh, I disagree with our friend from Yemen. Al-Qaeda is very well entrenched in Egypt is very well entrenched, including its supporters of the Jama'a Islamiyah and others, and, uh, and all the affiliates of the succession of bin Laden, who is Ayman al-Zawahri, as you know. They were all given a free hand under the one-year Muslim Brotherhood rule. So I do agree with Monsieur Donjon that what is happening in Egypt the birthplace of the, Mid the Muslim Brothers eight years ago and what is happening today is a major setback to this organization by partly dismantling it by the popular impeachment that happened. Now, what are the challenges? One of them is to prevent radicalization at the grassroots level. And two, it's mainly through education and culture. Mm. And as the, 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 the British uh, participant has said, it will not only be limited to local terrorism, but it will spread internationally. And that is why the main thing today is to try to sustain development in these countries that are facing terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, the gentleman there, um, if you could um, stand up and say your name and affiliation. Thank and again, you. since I, 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 I'm mouthing to everybody, I'll try because nobody's trying. So the faster you are, the more chance people have to speak. Thank you. Glenn Davidson. Uh, I returned on Thursday from being the, uh, the acting high commissioner ambassador in, uh, in Kenya. And oh. Prior to that, I was in uh, Afghanistan for the past year and a half as the ambassador. This subject is very close to my heart and my personal experience. Let me make two points. First, um, just to echo a point that Minister Blaney offered. Uh, the tactical advantage lies with the terrorists in communications. And the ability of governments to share success stories, intelligence, and in intercepting uh, successful operations is very limited. When it happens, it's hugely important. My own experience in Afghanistan, and to a limited degree in uh, Kenya, was that nine out of 10 uh, operations uh, were successful on the intelligence services part, and that a lot never made the press. Second point is that the focus of the panel this morning has necessarily been uh, domestic, the impact on nations uh, of, tar of uh, attacks against them. Uh, we all do business abroad. 
whether it's diplomatic targets, whether it's industrial uh, enterprises abroad, NGOs, etc. That's a whole other dimension, and many of those targets are soft targets for terrorists. This needs particular attention, and we need to work in, in environments where intelligence sharing can be difficult, and also where the response of governments uh, can be mixed, uh, mixed at best. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, before I coming back to the panel, I'll just let the, I think it's very important we have the lady from Afghanistan. Um, could we get the microphone over here, please? Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I had the experience to live in the Taliban time in Afghanistan and see by my eyes how terrorists are working. It's not only listening to the media and just I, I was witness and about the activity. First of all, let me tell you, Minister, congratulations. You win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people. But I also want to remind you the Afghans are not terrorists at all. Mm -hmm. We've been very civilized and good in the future. Mm -hmm. We want to be a good and reliable partner with you. And that's why 2,500 people across the country came and say, yes, President, go and sign the BSA with the United States of America. Why? Because we believe Terrorism, extremism is our mutual enemy, mm -hmm. which is we need to tackle that one. Mm -hmm. And for that, if you want to stay with us, we will can defeat them on their roots, mm -hmm. on their nets, which is they shouldn't grow anymore. Or if you live, then they will have space. Mm -hmm. When you are not somewhere, your enemy is there. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's very important from my experience and from my country experience and from your engagement, which is we give really value for that one. And that's why we want you to stay with us, to do not leave us. Because we believe extremism can be, and radicalism, the, the main source of Al-Qaeda and plus Al-Qaeda's, because it's not only one organization anymore. It's so many in every country. They have soft target, they have hard target, and also we shouldn't forget their uh, finance resources everywhere, including these uh, opiums and et cetera and et cetera. So my question is, would you like to be engaged more, not in a abroad war against terror, but just would you believe that extremism and fundamental radical Islamism is a case in a nut for terrorist activity or not? And if it's so, how you want to decrease that one? As a Muslim, we also want to give because our religion is based of peace. Mm. And we want to show that we are should be the one that we need to be, mm -hmm. not the one which is on a fanatics, Islamic groups are representing mm. that great religion today. And, and, and if you lived in Afghanistan in a corner, and I believe Afghanistan should be a successful story for war against terror. You killed Osama bin Laden, but where? Haqqani network, been destroyed, the leadership, where? Did you have any idea how to deal with the country which is still, they are promoting terrorists on the globe? Thank you. Thank you. I tell you what we'll do. We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to let whoever wants to, to remark on what's just been heard to make some, Mr. Moran, if you would like to. And then what I'll do, um, on condition, everybody's very good, and you literally put 10, 15 second points and pass the baton on, and we'll have a kind of question swarm, and then we'll let the, the panel come back to whatever they'd like to. But Mr. Morenis. Sorry. You, did, did you, you wanted to comment, did you? Well, I, 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 um, I have uh, listened very carefully what uh, our friend of, um, of Afghanistan has said. It is absolutely true. It is uh, uh, many of us here, we, have, uh, we will remain in Afghanistan forever because uh, at least in the Spanish people who were killed there was 101. So... This is a commitment of, uh, of, the, of a country of the West which will be in the mind of the Spanish people forever. And this is an example on how we should, uh, we should uh, think about this problem 
in a different way uh, as the way in which uh, we, 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 we view the problem when we arrive to Afghanistan and to other places in the world. This is something important. Second, it is my conviction that, um, that we, the only way to win is to apply the state of law and the uh, capacity, the, 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 the um, capacities that the state of law have, has to, um, to tackle the problem. Because, uh, and we, I say this because of my own experience. Uh, we have succeeded against another type of terrorism by, uh, by two facts. State of law applied in the, in the more uh, strong way, but state of law. And second, uh, moral resistance against the uh, feeling of uh, despair or d being defeated. This is the two things that we need. We are convinced that if we apply this, uh, whatever the, the basics uh, of the terrorism are, those of today, those of tomorrow, will be one. Will be one. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm going to do now, as I said, uh, is, is just, and, and I'm going to ask you to be very disciplined and just make a single point in 10, 15 seconds and then pass the baton on. What are my chances? Okay. Johanna Suleiman from Indonesia. We inter interrogate a bunch of terrorists actually a couple of m months ago, and bas basically what we found is that most of them are got getting the information from the internet, and most of them doesn't really have much religious knowledge. And and I guess to to your I mean the good point for them is they are very amateur. All the professionals are already dead or in jail or they don't know all the new guys. And all the new guys, basically, uh, they try to get att attention from the Al-Qaeda. That's why they blew, they, that's why they do act, they act terror. Hopefully, because the newspaper cover them, they will, I mean, they will get recognition, and the Al-Qaeda will, will give them money to, get, I mean, to, to build more bombs. So basically, that's kind of the things that we fi uh, face in Indonesia, that basically, it is like really, really grassroots, unorganized, very, very, I mean, there has, I mean, so it is like you said earlier, Al Qaeda, lot of Al Qaeda, but this is mini one. This is a common theme we're getting. And my question is, mm -hmm. how do you try to get rid of them without infringing f further to to human rights? Because at this point, the only thing you can do to prevent those kind of small attack is wiretap everybody. Well, Mr. Blaine is going to solve that problem in a moment. <laughs> so. um, and if you pass on the, to your to your neighbour. Hi, uh, my name is Imad Mezdu. I'm from Algeria, uh, a country that's had to deal with Al-Qaeda for about two decades now. Um, I just wanted to make a very quick point about the paradigm shift that we're witnessing in, in North Africa and Africa in general, which is the new battleground, I'd say. Uh, Al-Qaeda is no longer, as, as some of the speakers said, one entity, but many. Um, but it's also become a franchise and a business model more than anything. Because if anything, if we've learned anything from Mali and from Libya now, is that you have local chapters that are developing as a result of the creation of local economies that benefit uh, potential recruits. You have cigarette smugglers that are able to become from one day to the next emirs and millionaires. So how do we address that point? That's something we need to talk about, the economic potential and the economic uh, power that these Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, are able to transplant to local grievances. That's the first point. And the second point, maybe the elephant in the room, the, the, the massive influx of money from the Gulf into these nations that are sponsoring these uh, countless associations in North Africa and West Africa that create the kinds of groups that we've ignored for, for decades and that overnight become uh, a major uh, security threat like we saw in Mali. So I just wanted to emphasize the economic point. Thank you. It's very important. The lady here, please. Uh, Rosa Brooks from Georgetown University. Uh, two quick questions for the panel. Uh, one, uh, Faria al-Mizlami has drawn our attention to the danger of uh, counterterrorism approaches that either because they're over-militarized or they aren't in accord with our rule of law values end up creating as much anti-Western violent sentiment as they eliminate. Uh, so question one, how do we take that into account in our responses in the future? And question two, obviously there are opportunity costs to everything and recognizing that the threat of terrorism is real. Uh, there are many, many other longer-term, slower-moving 
uh, complex threats out there as well. We've, we've revamped, certainly in the United States, much of our national security apparatus to address terrorism. What are the opportunity costs? What are we not doing or not paying attention to as a result of our almost single-minded focus on terrorism that we need to also be worrying about? Thank you. And a final from the lady over there, and then we go to the panel to wrap up. Sarah Chase Carnegie, related to Rosa's and also to your earlier question about overstating, perhaps overstating the threat, reading bin Laden, it's really interesting how explicit he is that his goal was not to kill as many Westerners or Americans as he could, but rather to cripple the West or the United States economically so that okay. that would hamper a, fu a future ability to make policy decisions in the region. I wonder, have we fallen into that trap? Thank you and for a very concise question. Mm. Um, well, take whatever you want from what you've heard. I, I think one of the things I drew out from this is that we really are in a situation now where we're dealing with so many different issues. Yeah. We, we don't seem to have a precise focus. We have a strategy, we have our insurance policy, uh, we have our operatives out there. But in terms of the next wave of terrorism and what we do about it, uh, I'm getting the sense that the, there's, there's a tremendous variety of different issues people want to confront. And I wonder, we'll go starting with Mr. Morenis and working back. Um, what can we do to, 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 to address this problem? I mean, are we essentially lost in a, in a sea of new thinking, new ideas? We heard yesterday about new technologies, which we haven't actually discussed, and what happens if the terrorists get hold of the drones and that sort of thing. So, so it is a wide-ranging question, but as I say, I think that kind of suits the spirit of the time. I don't think that we're in a position to, to hone down where we go next exactly. But prove me wrong. Well, um, as far as I know, uh, all the strategies in the, the Western countries include the fighting against terrorism as something which is a priority. Uh, and this means that, um, that uh, the, the after that you should to, to apply all the capacities that you have and to, uh, to uh, identify the, the, the best capacities to fight with these specific problems. I mean the most efficient. And uh, this is something that all of us, we are doing. We are, uh, we are developing uh, technologies able to prevent the movements, to prevent the, the exchange of information, to prevent whatever um, lead or could lead to this type of, I, I'm, I mean, in, in order to fight against, no? It's from the prevention to the reaction. And I think that we are developing all these capacities, particularly those in communications which are probably the most dangerous in the way of, uh, of these uh, people uh, getting backed uh, by, by others, sharing uh, the, the, the feeling, sharing problems, sharing targets, and, uh, and feeling even uh, if we speak about uh, uh, lone, uh, lone wolves, I think that the lone wolves are not so lone. In, in the, the sense that they can be alone when they alone when they attack, but uh, but before they have uh, some uh, some type of ideologic uh, or whatever help they need. So I think that it is first looking at the problem, not not despising the problem. That's the the the, the important thing, and second to apply the the the, 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 the capacities uh, well linked with uh, and this is. The matter of we are exaggerating or not depending on the capacities we are applying to them. This is, could be exaggerated or not. But if we apply the most efficient, you are doing exactly your duty. Thank you very much. Um, Faria, perhaps speaking particularly to the point about, you know, there may be wolves, but they're not alone because they have an ideology. W what is it that we need to address in that respect? I, I mean, I, I, I would probably agree. Um, I think you need to define what is exactly the problem here. Why do we keep having new faces of terrorism and, 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 and um, what is, is the problem a, a nanodrone? So drone will solve it. Is the problem absence of development? Is the problem regime? So if you define what is actually the root, then you can have the solution because you can have the perfect solution for the wrong problem or for the no problem as we are having right now. I guess in, 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 in accurate and in, in specific, I would uh, be interested to see one thing, I think, what can we do? Um, in the past, there was one of the problems, I think, was um, the counterterrorism has been or was a cash cow and legitimacy cow. 
to the Arab rulers, and that needs to be stopped. Any problem that is a cash cow will never end, whether it's terrorism or that is uh, uh, youth empowerment, um, and, and that's one issue. The other issue is, I guess, even when it comes to security, to, uh, to counter terrorism, we have to solve things that do not directly have to react uh, uh, exactly to, the, to, to Al Qaeda. For example, and this is my very last thought, for example, before a terrorist arrives to a military base or to embassy to bomb, he has to go through specific roads. These roads have no police station, and this is where you need to, I think, direct your aid into it. I don't think it's that much connected to religion. I think some of Al Qaeda's are agnostic. And you've got to think about that in the future. It's not that much of uh, the same as old problem. Yeah, it's a very practical, um, practical suggestion, which I think we've been short of. Mr. Blaney, um, as quick as you can. Maybe a two message to uh, address, uh, to sum it up. You know, if you commit violence to reach your mean, you will face the full force of the law. That's one message. The other one, I'm a French-Canadian. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we are a nation built of uh, French-Canadian and English-speaking Canadian and native. Uh, we, as French-Canadian, were defeated in 19 and 1760 by the British. And, um, and in 1867, our very first prime minister said, uh, what do I do with the Quebecers? You know, like, they're French, they're not, they're not English. What do we do with them? Well, he said one thing. He said, treat them like a faction and you will have a lot of problems. Treat them with respect, and they will be your best ally. This gentleman said, why don't we talk about peace amongst religion? I think if we work, there, there's hope, you know, in this world for working together with respect. So that would be my, uh, my ending remark. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Mr. Donjon? I have two. Mr. Donjon, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Mr. Donjon, um, we just have plans yeah, going. Thanks. If you could just make... Um, uh, remarks uh, just to wrap up. It's hard to, after those uh, remarks from, from the minister from Canada. Oui, bon. C'est un français, il, il sait parler. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a microphone. Okay. Uh, two, two short points to conclude. You have first to have the right assessment to deliver the right policies. It's so obvious that it sounds stupid, but look at what we have done over the last decade. Uh, we sometimes have made uh, big, big mistakes in the 2000 years combating terrorism. We declared war on Iraq, a big diversion, uh, whereas to focus on, on, on Afghanistan, for example, and, uh, and, and right fight on, on terrorism. So right assessment means knowing the enemy. And as our Algerian or Egyptian colleague said, uh, the, it's not the same patterns everywhere. Uh, Acme in the, in the Sahel, it's not exactly that the, like the terrorist group in Pakistan. And you don't fight them the same way. Same for Egypt. I'm totally uh, uh, surprised, ashamed, I don't know how to say that, without giving a blank check to the military in Egypt, but the excessive indulgence of the West towards the Muslim Brotherhood. It's amazing. Like we don't know history, we don't know these people, we don't know who they are, we don't know the agenda they have they have had for the last 80 years, and how they have fueled all these groups that we are fighting now. So we get to know what we want to fight. So we have to get the right assessment and the right policies. It's a combination, subtle combination between development, governance, and security and military action. Uh, we had a lot of military action in the 2000s. Now we tend to come back to development and governance. We have to go both. Uh, that's what we want to do, for example, in Sahel, with a, a very combined, comprehensive approach. It's easy to say, it's very difficult to, to deliver, uh, in fact. Mr. Donjon, thank you very much. Robin, thank you very much for this. I'm sorry to end abruptly, uh, but thank you very much to our panelists. Give them we do have, um, because we have folks from all around the world who need to catch planes, and because the next panel became more relevant last night, we want to make sure that we get back on time. So we're going to have a, really a 10-minute break. We're going to start here back at 12.15 so that everybody has a chance for uh, WMD, who, uh, Who's Moral Dilemma. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>